Behavioral epigenetics are the effects the environment has on your genes. Specifically, it refers to the methylation of certain areas of DNA that result in different gene expression. By adding or removing methyl groups, the DNA passed down from one generation to the next can code for altered proteins, changing the behaviors and patterns of our children. It has been discovered that some elements or forms of conditioning are able to alter your genes, and then these altered genes are able to be passed down to future generations. These altered genes are able to affect our characteristics such as behavior, cognitive patterns, personality, health, or even our everyday habits. Epigenetics has been identified as an inheritable change in gene expression and cellular phenotype through chromatin remodeling. Essentially, epigenetics are defined as changes in DNA that are passed down through reproduction following multiple generations of offspring. So what you can see here is a DNA strand with an express gene. We have unraveled DNA wrapped around histones attached to acetyl groups. Here we have a methyl group and a protein attaches to this methyl group and another enzyme attaches to this protein which deacetylizes the DNA. The histones come together and the DNA is raveled once again and because of the methylation no active proteins can transcribe the DNA and so the gene is silenced. As a relatively new field Behavioral epigenetics is interdisciplinary in its approach and draws on many sciences such as neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry, genetics, biochemistry, and psychopharmacology. The sweet smell of fruit doesn't normally send rats running. But when researchers paired the orange cherry almondy scent of the chemical acetophenone with a painful electric shock, lab rats quickly learned to fear it. Along the way, extra neurons sprouted in their noses and in the smell processing center of their brains, making them super sensitive to the scent. This result isn't shocking. What is surprising is that the rats' pups and their pups' pups were also startled by the smell of acetophenone and had the same extra neurons as their fathers, despite never having been introduced to either their dad's or the fruity scent before. But how could the pups have inherited something that their fathers learned? Basic genetics tells us that only DNA gets passed along to offspring. Characteristics like memories, scars, or giant muscles can't get passed on since acquiring them doesn't alter the genetic code. But it turns out that instilling fear in the rats did trigger genetic changes, not in the DNA sequence itself, but instead in how that code was read and used in the rats' bodies. In every cell, biological machinery constantly translates DNA into the proteins needed to carry out vital processes. Chemical switches attached to the DNA turn genes on or off or up and down, telling the machinery which proteins to produce and in what quantities. These switches, called epigenetic tags, are why a kidney cell looks and acts differently than a skin or nerve cell, even though all three cells have identical DNA. But the switches in any one cell aren't set in stone. Teaching those rats to fear the fruity smell switched one of their smell sensing genes into overdrive. Researchers don't know all the places in the rats' bodies where this switch got flipped, but they know it happened in one key set of cells, the rats' sperm cells, which would one day pass along the tweaked genetic material, making the next generation of rats super sensitive to acetophenone. Rodents aren't the only creatures demonstrating this weird type of inheritance. In Ivakalik, Sweden, boys who suffered through tough winter famines went on to have super healthy sons, with extremely low rates of heart disease and diabetes. And their son's sons had the same excellent health, living an unbelievable 32 years longer on average than the grandsons of boys who hadn't gone hungry. To be clear, this does not mean that we should start starving our kids for the benefit of future generations. Scientists don't even know yet exactly which switches the Swedish famines flipped. While we have been able to connect specific epigenetic changes to health effects in mice, we're a long way off from being able to make those connections in humans. That may sound like a bummer, but it's mostly because we humans don't live in the well-controlled environment of a laboratory. And for that, we should be grateful. The field of behavioral epigenetics has many ties to psychology, and studies in this field have supported as well as challenged some of the basic views within this discipline. Nature versus nurture is the long-standing controversy over the relative contributions that genes and experience make to the development of psychological traits and behaviors. 
Behavioral epigenetics have a major connection to this controversy because the whole study is centered around the environment's effects on genes. Studies in this field bring up big questions on whether genes will have any factors that the environment won't be able to manipulate in the future. Classical conditioning plays a major role in experiments studying behavioral epigenetics. When working with animals, there are conditioned stimuli that are meant to cause a conditioned response that will hopefully be seen in the offspring of this conditioned animal. This is the best way to display how epigenetics work as well as prove that genes can be affected and controlled through the manipulation of certain stimuli. The evolutionary perspective and theories on natural selection have been brought into question by recent information found in epigenetical studies. If scientists are now able to change genes that are passed down to one's ancestors, then it is no longer nature that decides what traits will help with survival, but instead, it's humans themselves. There's a graph in this introduction, and it shows all of the different disciplines, the different areas in which epigenetics has been used, you know, over time. And then on the very, very end there, it'll show the human stuff, which you'll see is, you know, tiny. I don't know, there must be eight or 10,000 papers in, in, uh, in cancer, and maybe a couple hundred, you know, when it comes to uh, human. That's a good perspective to have also in terms of how how totally new this this field is. I think I think maybe what surprised me the most is the fact that you know when when people started um, doing this work, mm -hmm. the the assumption was that epigenetic effects are fairly fixed. You know, once they happen, they happen. And what we've learned is, I mean, not not fixed like like. Um, you know, genotype is fixed. The, the concept of fetal programming is based on epigenetics, right? That, that you know, the fetus can read, quote unquote, read physiological signals and then make adjustments um, in terms of their metabolic systems and, and, uh, um, and the mechanism for doing that is, is epigenetics. So it's dynamic. And that's a good thing, because that means that you can change it. Then you get to the postnatal environment, right? Okay. The kid is born, and you find out that, guess what? It's, it, the system is still plastic postnatally, mm -hmm. and um, so it's still dynamic. You can, you can change things after the baby is born. You know, the, 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 the nervous system is most plastic last trimester of pregnancy in the first few years of life. So the more things, so to speak, that happen during that time, uh, the bigger the effect that they're going to have. And so epigenetic change, epigenetic changes are easier to make uh, in the first couple of years uh, than they are later on. The older you get, the more resistant they, they are to change. So. You know, the kinds of environmental things um, that, I, I don't know if you say surprise me so much, but it, it's more the case, I think, that uh, there's a lot of variability in what goes on, um, uh, you know, prenatally in, in particular, and again, also, also postnatally. And when you look at all the different kinds of, uh, uh, factors, agents, uh, illnesses that affect epigenetics. I mean, the fact that so many of these things, you know, um, result in epigenetic changes, you're looking at the whole scope of what we're really talking about here. And, you know, from a scientific point of view, um, the, probably the, things that, the thing that excites me more than anything else is through epigenetics, you get to look at the molecular basis of behavior, right. right? Now, to me, that's extraordinary. Epigenetics provides the opportunity to revolutionize our understanding of the role of genetics and the environment in explaining human behavior, although the use of epigenetics to study human behavior is just beginning.